Well, here we are. Here we are. We're at LAX. Kiss me again. No, that's too much. Is that too much? Les and Addie loved music. Both would sing while Addie played the piano. Les would bring home recordings of glorious singers of the time. Richard Crook, John Charles Thomas, Jeanette MacDonald, B.B. Daniels, and Lily Pons. Suzanne would soul devour them, never getting enough. When she was five years old, Les and Addie took her to see Rio Rita with B.B. Daniels, a silent film star and then a new talkie, very popular singing star. Miss Daniels sang, You're Always in My Arms. Suzanne was entranced, and the seed was deeply planted. And for the next several weeks, Suzanne sang it everywhere. That's all anybody, her family, her playmates, her neighbors ever heard. It was decided that although You're Always in My Arms was a lovely song, they were getting a little tired of hearing it over and over and over again. There would have to be a way to satiate this little girl's performance desire. The five-year-old Broken Record was persuaded to perform it at a children's beauty pageant in a Minneapolis park. Suzanne was a hit. Family and friends never heard it again. But because now Suzanne, with a fresh Minneapolis park-inspired confidence, began to scan the marquees with an unmatched five-year-old fervor, then came along Jeanette MacDonald in her first film, The Love Parade, singing My Dream Lover. The five-year-old was at it again, and again, and again. For the next two years, if the local cinema was showing a musical film, the entire neighborhood knew what was playing without consulting the advertisements. Suzanne would be there on the first day, promptly, knowing all the tunes, singing them everywhere. All this at five years old. which was never, and Dalton Trumbull, which was never made. And then they let me go. Again, the, the, one of the heads out there, Nikki Nafak, said, kid, you, can, you can't sing, but you can act. So you better <laughs> go back to Minneapolis. See? He told you you couldn't sing? Said, I couldn't sing, but I could act. See, with a, they with liked a voice the screen like that? Test, see? Well, they, they have their own, he, had a, he was married to a singer. So, oh. you know, there are problems. There's a lot of nepotism and so on. So anyway, 
So I went out of there, that's the day I grew up. I was 13 and I went downstairs. My mother was crying in the car and I was left and we were supposed to go back to Minneapolis only I wasn't gonna give up and my mother wasn't either. So then she got me to an agent who had been connected with Deanna Durbin and they took me to Paramount. First they took me to a teacher. I'd never studied voice, you see. It was a natural instrument. The year that Suzanne turned five was the same year that the Great Depression of 1929 plunged America into years of poverty and despair for millions of Americans. The Larsons were not spared. Les swiftly lost his job with Sam Insull's Utilities Exchange Commission, or maybe it was more like Insull's Exchange Commission crumpled like a house of cards all around Les. Sam Insull and his power companies were Depression-era sleazeballs emblematic of our modern-day crooks like Enron's Ken Lay and Tycho's Dennis Kozlowski. Soon all hell broke loose all around the Larson family. Friends and neighbors lost their jobs, their homes, and their savings. Poverty, disease, alcoholism, and suicide became widespread. The Larsons were able to stave off the Great Depression's devastation, at least for a little while. Les had been secretly saving hard, cold cash in a wooden box under the back porch. The underground wooden box bounty amounted to about $10,000. The reason for the secret hideaway was that if Addie found out, it would have been spent a long time ago on her. No ifs, ands, or buts. So the economic decline for the Larsons wasn't as swift as it was for many in this deep, dark, cruel time. After about 1932, when the dollars did run out, things did swiftly decline. Les couldn't find work. He'd walk for miles in the drifting snow or the baking sun to sell a typewriter, fix a small appliance, or maybe to repair a car. They often moved every month, being evicted for lack of rent money living for weeks at a time with no cooking or heating gas, no lights. One winter, Les was humiliated when he had to steal gas from the downstairs neighbor to keep his family warm and to cook a hot meal. Oh, 